erupted on the streets. The pogroms, which were previously known as Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass, it's a reference to the many Jewish-owned shops destroyed by the Nazis, foreshadowed much worse to come. With anti-Semitism on the rise in many countries, today's commemorations have a particularly strong resonance. November 9th, 1938, a turning point in German history when hatred towards Jews took a further turn into systemic violence. By 1938, the Nazis had been in power for five years. They relentlessly persecuted Jews and excluded them systematically from society, barred them from working, boycotted their stores. What led to the November pogroms was the general mood and, above all, the German Reich's great interest in Jewish assets. Jews could be pressured into leaving the country, emigrating and transferring their assets to the German Reich. On November 7th in Paris, a desperate young Polish Jew had shot a German diplomat. The diplomat died on November 9th. The Nazis were in uproar and used this news as an opportunity to unleash a wave of violence against Jews. There was obviously a plan within the Nazi leadership to stage the whole thing as stemming from anger within the population. So they didn't want to give the order for pogroms, but if there were riots, there was no need to counter them. The November pogroms saw 1,400 synagogues torched and vandalized, and over 7,000 Jewish homes, schools and businesses destroyed. Some 1,500 people were killed or died in the aftermath. A memorial service is taking place at a synagogue in central Berlin to commemorate the November pogroms. And the head of the Central Council of Jews in Germany, Josef Schuster, is due to speak there shortly, followed by a speech from Chancellor Olaf Scholz. So for more on the ceremony and its significance, I'm now joined uh, from the outside of that synagogue by DW's chief political correspondent, uh, Nina Hase. Nina, even before the Israel-Hamas war broke out, Germany had been seeing an increase in anti-Semitic incidents and uh, they seem to be increasing yet again. The very synagogue you are standing uh, in front of was attacked a few weeks ago. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so we have seen a rise in anti-Semitic incidents over the last few years, Gerhard, and um, this is, of course, extremely worrying for the modern German state that, after all, says that um, never again means that um, everything must be done to protect Jewish life in Germany and that the modern German state is actually founded on that principle that Jews need to be protected and that the state of Israel needs to be protected. So the rise of anti anti-Semitic incidents in previous years had been from the far right. Right-wing extremist um, incidents have been surging. Also during uh, COVID, we saw an, a tremendous rise as well in conspiracy theories, accusing Jews of too much power in the world. And now, of course, the Israel-Hamas war is um, pushing other people to the streets as well with uh, incitement of hatred. And uh, the, Jewish, uh, the German state is doing everything it can to protect synagogues and uh, also Jewish institutions. But there is this fear here that um, Germany might be at a tipping point and that civil society needs to do more to make it clear that the events from the 9th of November 1938 must never happen again because, of course, that was the beginning of the Shoah. Many people call it the catastrophe before the catastrophe, so the extermination of Jews in Europe. Six million Jews were killed by the Nazis uh, during the Second World War, of course. And uh, there is this increased feeling because uh, Jewish institutions here say that they are seeing that, for example, the Star of David is being painted on their doors. Uh, Jewish parents say here in Germany that they can't send their kids to kindergarten anymore without fearing that something might happen. And sometimes we are seeing proof. So today, the central commemoration event where the um, the president of the Council of Jews and the German Chancellor are speaking is going to take place here behind me in a private synagogue. 
And that was the target of a, a, an attempted arson attack a couple of weeks ago. And that was the result of um, the news coming out of the Middle East, where there were reports that uh, allegedly the IDF had uh, attacked a hospital in Gaza. Now, later, that, of course, proved not to be true. Um, but nevertheless, this violence in the Middle East is translating into a lot of anger also on German streets, which is why this trend is now being seen also by German um, representatives that uh, right-wing extremists is still the biggest threat to Jewish life in Germany. But we are also seeing uh, this trend coming from Islamists and also from the far left. Uh, thank you, Nina. So, so far, uh, with me in the studio here is Shani Rahanis, um, DW correspondent. Uh, Shani, this is the 85th anniversary of the November programs. Uh, in 1938, which used to be known as Kristallnacht. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't use that term anymore. Uh, what stands behind this name and the name change? Well, the feeling was that Kristallnacht might not be giving, given enough explanation of the horror that we've been seeing. You know, uh, Nina was mentioning this to be seen as a catastrophe for the catastrophe, the, the, the beginning of uh, what will later be become an institutionalized, system, systematically uh, 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 seen effort by the Nazi regime to uh, exterminate the Jews in Germany and in Europe. Um, but the change to the word pogrom, the, 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 the origin of that word actually refers to disturbances and, and attacks on Jews in Russia, which were very common in the early uh, 20th century, uh, late 19th century, um, and they were very much like what we're seeing, sort of disturbances that were attacks, based, basically uh, based on mobs um, that were just lynching people, attacking houses um, and Jewish uh, institutions, as we've been seeing also happening in Germany. And the idea of the name change was to maybe help describe better uh, the big break, the big tragedy that starts on that day. Mm. So this night. Why was it so significant? And Nina has hinted on it. Uh, but it was the first, it wasn't the first uh, sign that uh Jews were in trouble, it was sort of a culmination. Correct. I mean, there was, throughout, I mean, uh, the, you know, Hitler comes to power in 1933, and this is 38. This is five years that Jews have been living in Germany under um, Nazi regime, and they've been seeing their freedom uh, slowly, you know, being, you know, uh, shrinking and shrinking with measures getting um, more and more dire. But in, in 38, we see actually you know, again, we were talking about the systematic effort of, of the Nazi regime. We see it in thirty-eight becoming more organized in, in executions, uh, in, in eviction of Jews mm. uh, from originally from Poland, but also German Jews out of Germany. This was the moment of reckoning for many Jews. If you talk about the meaning of the of the night of the programs, uh, if you talk about testimonies of Jews, many German Jews living here felt safe. They wanted to see themselves as German of the faith of Moses. They wanted to see themselves, themselves as equal to any other German. Um, and all of a sudden, this act of brutal violence coming um, in such, you know, masses all over Germany. That was a moment of reckoning for many of them to realize as much as we kept on thinking, no, it's not going to happen, it's not, it, it is happening. Mm. We are seeing in front of our eyes something never, we've never seen before. It's not just a change of our names and not just the passports. It's not just adding the names Israel or Sar. All sorts of, of ways in which uh, the Nazis use in order to uh, identify Jews and single them out um, and make their lives harder. And that's, that's what I, I want to talk about because it, it was, it was uh, hardly the first big blow for the Jewish community in, in, in Germany. The, the Nuremberg uh, race laws came in, I believe, in 1935. Correct. And... Uh, People are often asking why did more Jews leave after the race laws came in than after 38? Still many Jews chose uh, uh, to stay in, in, in Germany. Well, let's, first of all, let's talk about the numbers that we're talking about before the war. There were about half a million Jews living in Germany. Um, after the war, the Allied forces have recovered, uh, documented 15,000 of these half million, just to tell you of uh, what happened here in Germany alone, not to mention the rest of Europe and, and European Jews. Um, the question of why didn't they leave? I think that that's something still haunting a lot of a lot of Jews, um, a lot of how could not you know how could not have seen what, what where this country was heading back then, 
and again, I think it goes back to them seeing themselves, many of them were born in Germany, raised in Germany, had ties, business ties and family ties with, with non-Jewish Germans. Had fought in, for Germany in the in First, the World, First World, War. World War. Many of them fought and died for what they saw as the only homeland. Um, they could not believe they'll be you know, be getting this treatment. And uh, we've also seen throughout the years slow progress, but also most of it stayed on paper. It seemed like a lot of bureaucracy. It seems like a lot of badgering. And, but it was never violent in the pure sense of, you know, the traditional sense of violence that we're used to. And they felt, the feeling was, OK, so, yeah, it's going to... It's gonna, that too shall pass. Jews are used to being prosecuted or oppressed or, you know, throughout history. Um, and all of a sudden when uh, Pogrom Nacht came, it, the realization was this is far more than just, you know, um, nuances of bureaucracy and, and for their own. Many of them tried to then escape. The, the Nazi regime was encouraging that, but it wasn't happening in a fast enough pace for the Germans. And then they shift gears into active, systemized, you know, acts of, um, of exporting Jews into the uh, eastern part of, of Germany and, you know, uh, concentration camps uh, and everything that we know about the Holocaust and the six million Jews who perished in it, unfortunately. Uh, Shani, we're going to continue this conversation in a moment. Uh, I believe Josef Schuster, the head of the Central Council of Jews in Germany, is preparing to start his speech. Let's uh, listen into that. Federal President, President of the Federation Council, Chancellor, in representing the government, President of the Constitutional Court, Excellencies, the survivors of the Shoah, Dear Mr. Lubarski, as the chairperson of the Karl Hadjadas Israel community, I would like to thank you for receiving us today for this memorial service. The members of families of more than 200 hostages of Hamas, I would like to extend a particular welcome to you. We think of your dear and loved ones. More than 1,000 people murdered, devastation and pillage, families brutally torn apart. That could mean I speak about 9th November 1938, the Reichsprogramm. But I could also say the same about a contemporary pogrom, the cruel Hamas terror of October 7th. The descriptions are similar. If you want to understand what Jews are feeling these days, you have to understand how the historical pogrom experience has shaped Jewish thinking. The persecution of Jews wherever they live is deeply inscribed in the collective consciousness of Jews. If you want to understand why the terrorist attack on Israel causes deep traumas, fears and insecurities among Jewish communities in Germany, you need to understand what is haunting Jewish souls 85 years after the Reich's pogromnos, when once again they see the Star of David painted on Jewish houses, when Jewish shops are once again attacked, when arson attacks are committed on synagogues, as it happened a few weeks ago at the Beth Zion Synagogue. Hum I would like to thank the state of Berlin for the security measures. They have stepped up for this synagogue. I would like to ask you to once again check the security measures and see what needs to be done. You must understand what is happening in people's minds when a mob marches through the streets demanding the destruction of Israel and the extermination of all Jews a few hours after the most atrocious crime against Jews since the Shoah. It is an attempt to deliberately produce fears, and that is why the remembrance of November 9, 1938 is so important. It is not always possible to ris resist these attempts at intimidation. Many people of the Jewish communities in Germany have such 
a pogrom experience. They have uh, just seen the pictures of the airport of the Russian region of Dagestan. Those manhunts uh, were not uncommon during the collapse of the Soviet Union. These images are disturbing, but they clearly show that Hamas's ideology of extermination has no limits. Those who call for a day of rage against Jews are not only concerned with Israel. The images from Dagestan seem far away, or are they? Jewish life is highly protected in Germany. That is probably the biggest difference to the year 1938. The violence at that time was fueled by the National Socialists. Today, the state protects the Jewish community. That is a me message that resonates with Jews in Germany. And for this, I would like to thank you here and today. But isn't it conceivable that such a manhunt for Jews could once again take place in Germany? A mob incited by fanatics who openly stir up hatred on TikTok, on Telegram. Five weeks ago, I would have said, I can't imagine it. But today, I'm no longer so sure. Is it really any different when I see pictures of the Brandenburg Gates on the evening of October 7th? And a couple of hours later, a Molotov cocktail attack has been committed on this very synagogue. Protection can never be absolute, no matter how hard you try. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past few weeks, I sometimes had the feeling I don't recognize this country anymore. It has been tolerated to publicly propagate the destruction of Israel and the extermination of all Jews. It has been tolerated that thousands of people with Arab immigration background, incited by radical fanatics, went to the streets and demanded all this again. Once again, I say it was only a few hours after the horrific attacks by Hamas. The mindset of radical Islamists who would like Israel and the Jews to be destroyed has a lot in common with the right-wing extremists who despise our culture of remembrance, the remembrance of Shoah. German responsibility for Israel is at the heart of this remembrance. Amongst left-wing extremists and in left-wing circles, one can also see the contempt for this tradition, including the tradition of remembering no November 9, 1938. What used to be the demonization of Jewish people has now given way to the idea of Israel as a Western colonial state, which is devoid of any historical facts and context. What an unholy alliance has emerged here. November 9, 1938 was the ultimate demonstration of hatred of Jews, and one thing was for sure. The vast majority of Germans would either just stand by and watch the murderous rampage or become perpetrators themselves. Violence targeted the symbols of Jewish life, but also commonplace things, such as the countless private synagogues that symbolize the emancipation of Jews in Germany, private synagogues just like this one. If Israel rights to exist is Germany's reason of state today, then that also means it is inextricably linked to the remembrance of November 9, 1938, its horror, its cruelty, and everything that followed the Shoah. If you say one thing, you must also say the other. That is the logical conclusion. Not everyone wants to hear, and not everyone wants to, draw, wants to draw anymore. Something is out of joint in this country. We can still repair it. But to do that, we have to acknowledge what has gone wrong in recent years, what we have been unable or unwilling to see. This also includes the realization that behind closed doors, anti-Semitism in Germany has penetrated right into the heart of society, above all Israel-related anti-Semitism. As is evident in university lecture halls and theaters, even middle-class suburban homes. If after October 7th you still believe that BDS is just a harmless pseudo-intellectual babble, you are beyond help. But there are also signs of confidence to theater directors that signed the GG53 initiative, which ultimately encourages BDS ideology in Germany, have withdrawn their signatures. It is this honesty that we need so badly today. 
I know that politics is seldom a business where we just have black or white, but these days there can be no doubt when it comes to Israel's right to defend itself. This is not a time for restraint or abstention, ladies and gentlemen. We Jews cannot be extended to show restraint anyway. When Israel is under attack, the Jewish community in Germany stands side by side. Our hearts are with the people of Israel. That is just the way it is. These days, our thoughts are especially with the over 200 Hamas hostages and their families. And we also demand this solidarity coming from everyone. It is our self-confidence as Jews in Germany. We stand firmly together, especially in times of threat. We will not be intimidated. That is also one of the lessons of historical pogrom experience that we have had on November 9th, 1938. Jews in Germany are strong and self-confident. I've talked to many members of our communities over the past few weeks. Yes, I was shocked. I am shocked by the great fear people told me about. But at the same time, I'm also impressed seeing the courage and resilience of our community. I have great respect for the work done by the young members of the uh, Jewish community, the Jewish Student Union and others. They have done a lot to promote cohesion within the Jewish community. Even in these difficult times, it makes me look into the future with optimism. Ladies and gentlemen, protection is good and it is important right now, but we don't want to have shields around us. We want to live freely in Germany, in our country. We want to live freely in this open society. And even though it seems rather unrealistic now, the formulation of our wish is perhaps all the more important. We want to live freely. We don't want to be dependent on protection. This is my wish, and I will not let this wish be taken away from me. I would like to thank you all for coming here. And I also would like to thank everyone who is uh, watching TV and seeing this memorial service. And that was uh, this speech from Dr. Josef Schuster, the head of the Central Council of Jews in Germany. And we follow this memorial ceremony a bit further. There's music coming up. And we're back in the studio. Uh, Shani, let's discuss uh, uh, briefly this this speech by Josef Schuster this, on this very special day, in more than one way special day. Uh, what stood out for you there? Well, you know, I think the key, and you know, it's also important in order to understand what's happening in the last weeks, is him talking about Jewish trauma, how the events of October 7th have ignited that, have made that resurface. And I think, you know, many times the discussion about Israel, about the Middle East, it's very contested, it's very heated, it's very emotional for people. And, and terms are often mixed, you know, can we be critical, you know, against Israel and its government without being anti-Semitic, and how do we do that? And the feeling was that the response of the Jewish communities around the world and in Israel has not, you know, let, given enough space to, to let this discussion happen. But if you want to understand the psyche, the emotions that are, you know, connected to all of that, for Jews, this is what it was, um, October 7th, the, the trauma, the feeling of um, nowhere is safe, our very own homeland that we've built is not safe, but also we've seen a rise in anti-Semitic attacks all over the world, in Europe, in the US, uh, in South America. Following that, that brings up these memories of the 30s that we were just mentioning, and you were talking about how come Jews were not, you know, in 38, it was after several years of, under Nazi regime, how come Jews did not escape? And here, there's a feeling, even when we did escape, we made it to our own homeland, we're still not safe there. And the feeling of Nowhere is safe. You know, that is the root of the Jewish mm. trauma that uh, Schuster is trying to maybe convey uh, to the public, to the wide audience mm. in this uh, speech. Uh, what stood out for me was this one sentence when he said uh, a diagnosis, uh, in a way, about Germany as a Jew living in Germany, a German Jew, saying something has become 
unstuck in this mm -hmm. country. That scared me a bit. What did he mean by that? Again, we're talking about the deep fear that Jews feel uh, in Germany. The background, you know, October 7th, um, has its, its own uh, new climate of, of the discourse that it brought. But if we talk about AfD, for example, in the last years, we've been seeing them grow... That's the far-right exactly, party the, that's been surging correct, in Germany correct, for a Correct, the while. Alternative for Deutschland, the far-right uh, party in Germany. I mean, other political parties have been very clear in, in, its, in their uh, objection to it, but the public does not necessarily follow. We've seen that grow in, 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 in numbers. Um, and we need to keep in mind, you know, the, the Gaza discussions bring us into the and, and Schuster was mentioning the far of the extreme motivated um, Muslim uh, parties and, and, and incited crowds, but that in the same time, statistically, most attacks on Jewish institutions um, are held by extreme right activists. You know, most of anti-Semitism the Jews have endured in Europe, in Germany, they occur by, by Germans and Christian, Christian Germans. If we have to bring the religion into mm. that, um, then they're not necessarily Muslims. And this is something we need to keep in mind as well, that we see now this, this um, what, what the, the Gaza conflict is bringing up. It's coming from all different places. And again, how do we differentiate between the legitimate criticism of Israel and what we were seeing is um, when there are calls to annihilate Israel and Jews where they are, this is beyond legitimate criticism of what the Israeli army forces and what the Israeli government is doing in Gaza. Um, this is where we draw the line. Mm. Uh, also, we've talked about uh, uh, the, the, the right wing, uh, the right wing anti-Semitism. We talked about Muslim anti-Semitism. But uh, Jews are apparently also coming under attack from a different direction. Uh, if you look at American universities, what, what's happened there, uh, and Schuster's mentioned it in his speech as well, is, is, is anti-Semitism, not only on the extreme left, but also on the moderate left uh, now. What did he mean by that? Well, we, we've seen that. We live in a world of, of social media, of TikTok videos, you know, and you got to take a stand and you got to be for or against and you got to decide within seconds. Something in the discourse is very flat. Something in this discussion is, is very flat. It doesn't let the complexity where the truth is and where life is exist. Um, and this is partially what we're seeing also with, you know, universities in the States. I mean, I think students have always tended, you know, especially in America, you look at the history, they've always tended to be more liberal. Um, there's, of course, great um, solidarity with the Palestinian cause. Uh, and there are many Jews all over the world and in Israel who agree there should be uh, a vehicle for Palestinian statehood that agree on that very principle. But again, we're talking about how, what, what would that entail when people chant from uh, the river to the sea, um, Palestine will be free. I'm not what sure. does it mean? Well, uh, you need to ask those people what they mean. But on the surface, it seems like it means there's no room for Jews in the, in the land of Israel, in the, land, in, the, in, the, in the stretch of land that is called Palestine, historic Palestine. So that would initiate, I mean, the annihilation of Jewish existence or Zionist existence in the state of Israel. So that's something, again, uh, I'm not sure all people, you know, we're talking again about how, how people stick to the slogans. And this is a very, you know, complicated conflict. People don't always know the in and outs of it. Uh, but that is what de facto it's been interpreted as if you ask Jews and Israelis when they hear that slogan. Mm. Uh, since today is the day of remembrance 85 years ago of the November pogroms in Nazi Germany uh, when Jews were, were attacked in synagogues and, and Jewish business, businesses uh, torched, just to remind our viewers uh, why we are talking about this, uh, he also mentioned what happened in Dagestan. I mean, we saw 85 years ago mobs of Germans attacking uh, Jewish people, Jewish businesses and, and, and synagogues. And what happened in Dagestan, this mob that stormed right. an airport, actually hunting for Jews. This right. is what and, and they, they did. knew there's a flight coming in from Tel Aviv. From Tel Aviv, exactly. And they assumed, rightfully so, there'll be Jews on it. Um, some Was of them it an echo, you think? Um, definitely. I mean, anti-Semitism in Russia, you know, we, we were talking about the, the word pogrom, which originally comes to describe the disturbances and the attacks that, that were taking place in, in the territory of uh, the Russian Empire on Jews. And that is exactly that, you know, the, 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 the incited uh, mob looking for Jews wherever they are uh, for no matter what. I mean, some of the people who were on those planes, the people who were living in, in that area, who traveled to Israel back and forth for all sorts of reasons. And 
that doesn't matter anymore. You, you, their, their citizenship, their, their part, you know, their contribution to the society in which they live, which could be the Russian one, it doesn't matter anymore. Now they're Jews and therefore they're prosecuted for that. And this is exactly what we talk about when we talk about anti-Semitism. It doesn't distinct between anything else. You know, once you become a Jew, that's the only thing that characterizes you and nothing else matters anymore. And that is the, that is the very, very slippery slope that we need to be very careful of. And, and I have to say, the German government is very much aware of it, and it's put a lot of efforts in the last week to, to draw that line, to show solidarity with Israel, to draw the line of where is the discourse, you know, going beyond what it's legitimate to say, and also at the same time trying to say we facilitate, we allow demonstrations, the show of grief and pain and solidarity with the Palestinians. These things should not be, you know, contradicting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Chancellor Olaf Scholz is uh, just entering uh, the podium there to uh, deliver his speech. Let's uh, listen in. Sehr geehrter Herr Schuster. Dear Mr. Schuster. Sehr geehrter Herr Bundespräsident. Sehr geehrter Frau President, Präsidentin des Bundestags. President of Parliament. Sehr geehrter Präsident des Bundesrats. Sehr Präsident of the Federal Council. Sehr geehrter Präsident des Bundesverfassungsgerichts. Sehr Präsident of the Federal Constitutional Court. Sehr geehrter Herr Botschafter Prozor. Esteemed Ambassador Prozor. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen Dear Kabinett, colleagues Bundestag of den the Bundestag, the Cabinet Deren and the Federal States, esteemed guests of honor, ladies and gentlemen, von Ihnen waren dabei, some of you have been present when Eli Fachler 10 years ago talked about his memories of the night of November 9, 1938. Verborgen hinter den Gardinen der Familienwohnung against, er als 15 behind the curtains of his family home, he, the 15-year-old boy, saw his synagogue here at Brunnenstraße being pillaged. He described how everything was destroyed. The wooden benches were smashed. And he talked about the windows being broken. He described how he felt the fear of being killed. He said it was a normal day in the morning when he first went to school. Today, we can gather once again at Beth Zion Synagogue, and this is due to the special situation of this building. It is surrounded by many other buildings. And the perpetrators did not dare set fire to the synagogue. They were afraid of other houses catching fire too. It is really amazing that this building wasn't turned to ashen. And it has something to do just with the trivial situation of the building situation. No neighbors were there to help the people. Nobody came to protect this building here at Brunnenstrasse 33. And even after that night, from the 9th to the 10th of November 1939, when there were broken glass on the streets throughout Germany, when Jewish families were arrested, there was no open protest. There were just a few courageous men and women. The rest of the Germans just remained silent. Many times the post-war generation asked, what did they do when the Jewish families were arrested and murdered. Martin Niemöller, the theologian, said after the war, it's a bitter logic, a logic of a step-by-step -step destruction of a society right into the middle of the atrocities of Shoah. People always were able to turn a blind eye and say, it doesn't affect me, it just affects the others. Oftentimes, people said, when the Nazis uh, arrested the communists, I didn't say anything, I wasn't a communist. When they arrested the Social Democrats, I didn't say anything, I wasn't a Social Democrat. And when they arrested the trade unionists, I was silent, I wasn't a trade unionist. And when they got the Jews, I was silent, because I was not a Jew. When they arrested me, there was nobody left to protest against my arrest. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we and the others, the others that are not part of our community, this kind of subdivision is the demise of a society, a catastrophe where intolerance in humanity starts, as Martin Niemöller once described. The necessary and central answer is given in the first sentence of our constitution. The dignity of every human being is inviolable. This is not just a statement. This is our task. It is our task to defend human dignity, to be active and stand up against marginalization and structuring societies in those who are with us and not with us. Marginalization has affected the Jews over centuries, time and again, even here in our democratic Germany, and even though the Shoah took place in this country and was committed by Germans. It is a shame. It is a shame, and I feel deeply ashamed. 2023 is a year when, once again, we see the Star of David on the walls. We, in order to marginalize uh, Jewish citizens and mark their shops and houses, when Hamas is being celebrated for their terrorist attacks in our streets. When Jewish men and women are afraid to openly live and show their culture and religion, to use their fundamental rights and be members of our society. When once again the synagogue is the synagogue here is once again attacked. 85 years after the pogrom of November 9th, 1938. Mr. Schuster, indeed, as you said, something is out of joint. It does not play a role whether anti-Semitism comes from the right or the left, whether it is embedded in uh, arts, works, or scientific uh, discussions whether it comes from inside or outside Germany, any form of anti-Semitism is poison for our society, just as we see in the Islamist demonstrations. We are not tolerating anti-Semitism, nowhere. It is all about fulfilling the promise that we have given time and again in the decades after 1945, the promise that is the foundation of our democratic Germany, the promise never again. This promise must be fulfilled by us here and now. Not only with words, we have to walk the talk, we have to take action. Never again means we need to physically protect Jewish communities and institutions. Providing this protection, as you said, uh, Federal President, the obligation of the state and also society. But that alone is not enough. You're right, Mr. Schuster. And Jews in Germany have to live behind shields all the time. Then this is not tolerable. Never again also means that police and uh, judicial organs need to consistently implement the law. Nothing, no cultural background, no political conviction, no so-called post-colonial assessment of history can be used as the reason to murder and slaughter uh, innocent people and celebrate this murder. Any form of anti-Semitism, terrorist propaganda and inhumanity will be eradicated. Who incites anti-Semitic hatred will have to be 
persecuted. We have a clear-cut regulation. Anti-Semitism is a reason not to be given German citizenship. Never again is not a word that applies to the streets and the squares of German towns. Also, it concerns the virtual space where ideologies are being formed, where people are discriminated against. And that is why it is so important for us to be consistent in everything we do. And therefore, everybody must, must know anti-Semitism is a crime and it also affects the rights of people who display anti-Semitism to stay in Germany. Uh, it is very good that we have now the Digital Services Act and we can insist on the big platforms to uh, stand up against anti-Semitism. It is necessary to have such a law in uh, Europe because such uh, Incitement to hatred is a danger for the basis of our democracy. Never again means we have to keep the memory alive of the crime against humanity, the Shoah. We have a historical responsibility, and everyone who lives in that country and everybody who wants to live in that country must accept this responsibility and seeing it as their very personal own responsibility. It is the foundation of our democratic society. Understanding our social and historical responsibility has to be taught in schools, universities, integration courses, and it must be part of our day-to-day -day life so that the young generation will understand historical events, even if contemporary witnesses are no longer alive. And we need to reach in Germany even those people that have a totally different cultural background and had been told about the Shoah in their countries of origin in a totally different way. But at the same time, we should not accept that uh, there are other people in our society wishing uh, to get, not to have any people of Muslim faith. Our free and democratic constitution, our order, that demands tolerance and diversity. This is the foundation we need to defend. Never again that also means friendship and an alliance with Israel. The awful events that happened on October 7th can lead only to one conclusion for us. Germany's place is at the side of Israel. Israel has the right to defend against the barbarism, the terror of Hamas, terror that killed innocent people, terror that uh, killed men, women, old ones and children. Terror that wants to destroy Israel and all its citizens. Our compassion, our feelings are with all people that have lost friends and family members. Our thoughts are with the people that are still afraid about the fate of their loved ones, loved ones that are still being held hostage by the terrorists. When I visited Israel, I could talk to some of the family members. Their deep concern, their pain is something I remember forever. The federal government is going to do everything we can to make sure the hostages will return to their homes. Our friendship with Israel also means that we foster exchange between Germans and Israelis wherever possible, youth encounters, volunteer services, in business, arts, culture, science, between state institutions and between our societies. It is 
this deep relation that we are going to use to stand up for a durable, sustainable peace in the Middle East. Never again also means we stand up against hatred. And that is why I'm very happy that many citizens everywhere in Germany have shown their solidarity with the victims of Hamas terrorism during meetings, rallies, and even in social networks. That gives me hope. It strengthens our society, our cohesion. I would like to thank all of you that stand up for humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, our Germany is based on the cohesion of all our societies. People of Jewish faith are, of course, part of our society. And together we have to stand up against terror and hatred. Never again. That is a promise that still holds true. We are going to fulfill that promise today, tomorrow, and forever. Thank you very much. And that was German Chancellor Olaf Scholz there at that ceremony commemorating the November programs of 1938, 85 years ago today. And we're going to be hearing a Jewish prayer now. Gedenkgebet für die Opfer der Shoah und des jüngsten Terroranschlags in Israel. Shani Rahan is here in the studio. Can you tell me um, more about this prayer? Yes, we're hearing a prayer called El Malera Hamim, the Merciful God. It's a traditional prayer said um, in funerals, um, originated in Eastern Europe for Jews. Um, it had had several alterations following several tragedies of the Jewish people. Um, and after the Holocaust, it, it got its last uh, alteration, uh, which we are now hearing this kind of this, this rendition now by the rabbi, who is the uh, federal rabbi of the uh, uh, armed forces of Germany. Um, like many other prayers, it just calls for a better life, um, the afterlife for those who the merciful God has taken uh, to his um, custody. Beeri Netiva Asara Cholit Nir Oz Ubishar Yeshuve Otef Aza Alie de Mechablim Haserim Rachemim Yimachem Amevesi. We have heard um, the rabbi add the names, the long list of uh, Jewish settlements and towns that were directly hit during the Hamas attack on October 7th into the pair. Um, be naming each and every of these uh, many uh, Jewish towns who were hit um, on October 7th. <laughs> 
ויצרור בצרור החיים את נשמותיהם אדוני הוא נחלתם וינוחו בשלום על משכבותיהם ונאמר ויהלמה <laughs> וימליך מחותך בחיי חון וביומי חון ובחיי דכל בית ישראל בעגלה ובזמן קריב ואמרו אמן יהי שמי רבה מברך לעלם וללמי עלמיה יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי דקודשה בריחו לאלה מן כל ברכתה ושירתה תושבחתה ונחמתה דאה מירן בעלמה ואמרו אמן יהי שלה מרה במין שמיה וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. And this prayer concludes the uh, ceremony of a remembrance here in a synagogue in central uh, Berlin, and our Chief political correspondent Nina Hase is at that synagogue and has listened in to that speech. And I'm still with Shani Rahanas, our correspondent here in the studio, to talk about this ceremony. Nina, let's start with you. What stood out for you in the Chancellor's speech? Well, Olaf Scholz in his speech reiterated um, that there can be absolutely no room for anti-Semitism in Germany. And of course, uh, this is of deep concern for the Jewish community living in Germany here. The Israel-Hamas war has intensified something that we've seen over recent years already, that there is a rise of anti-Semitic incidents that um, is tangible. And so the Jewish community has been warning that uh, this trauma is being it is resurfacing essentially and Olaf Scholz reiterated that uh, the German society has to do everything it can to make it clear to everyone that this is not going to be tolerated. After all, he said, it's one of the founding principles of the modern German state. Germany promised that this, the Nazi atrocities would not happen ever again. Many politicians have echoed that also today at Bundestag at the German parliament. Never again is now, they're saying. And Olaf Scholz said it doesn't actually matter where this anti-Semitism comes from because we have to keep in mind with everything that's going on in the Middle East and with all the, 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 the anger that's also being seen on German streets here because of that, right-wing extremism is still the biggest threat to Germany's security and that is also where the majority of anti-Semitic incidents are coming from. Olaf Scholz says it doesn't really matter. There can just be no room because if you see that groups are being marginalized and he said we are seeing the Star of David again on walls here where Jewish people live in Germany. That is the beginning of intolerance and that quickly can lead to the demise of society. Now talking about foreign policy, he says Germany's side is um, firmly by, uh, Germany's position is firmly by Israel's side, that the German government is going to do everything it can to bring the hostages back home, that Germany is very aware and that there can be no justification whatsoever, no matter what which political camp you're coming from um, to justify the brutalism that the terrorist organization Hamas has shown.
Uh, this unwavering stance, and we're going to talk about a bit more how unwa unwavering it really is, of Germany uh, behind Israel, uh, has also caused uh, criticism of Germany's position on the international stage, hasn't it? I would say it has caused criticism internationally, but also domestically. Olaf Scholz also hinted at that, saying that uh, we are seeing that the young generation uh, as well is shifting its focus. And of course, Gerhard, that can be easily explained. I grew up, my generation grew up with grandparents who witnessed uh, the Second World War. Some of them actively fought, uh, were members of the Nazi party. We had intense discussions. Now, these people are becoming fewer and fewer simply because because the Second World War is uh, a long time ago now. And uh, Olaf Scholz said that more needs to be done to educate also young people about the atrocities and about how this brutal uh, terror regime of the Nazis uh, actually came into being at the time. But uh, he also said we have to be realistic. Uh, many immigrants coming into Germany are also being taught different things about the Shoah in their home countries. So that has to be aligned as well. And then he says there's also right-wing extremism here uh, among uh, Germans who have been living here with their families for generations. So uh, this is a tremendous challenge also at home. Internationally, of course, Germany has been criticised, for example, at the United Nations when there was a resolution and Germany abstained, not voting together with the US and Israel, because Germany argued that they had to keep some diplomatic channels open also to Arab countries because they they say, after all, we are the modern Hopefully German something. state is a state that is founded on the on the principles of humanity, and we need to end the uh, the, the dying of civilians, and that needs to be top priority. And for that, diplomatic channels need to stay open as well. But it is a tightrope walk. Our uh, chief political correspondent Nina Hase there. Thank you very much, Nina. And uh, still with me in the studio, DW Middle East analyst Shani uh, Rosanna. Shani, uh, that speech by um, Olaf Scholz there, um, what's your take on it? Well, I think the symbolism that we see, you know, we, we, we heard shots, but we saw also in the current Frank Walter Steinmeier, the president, we've seen um, Habak and, um, and Baerbock, uh, the leaders of the Green Party. We've seen also uh, the Minister of Interior. Um, there are many uh, leading German politicians standing behind that cause that resonate, that's, that's very meaningful. Um, the Chancellor was talking about how, you know, there can never be tolerance for anti-Semitism. But he also mentions the need for consequences. And I think this is also something that needs to go hand in hand. Otherwise, this is just lip service. Um, mm. uh, and we've seen uh, the great devotion from the, Israeli pol uh, the German politicians to, to make the right statements. It also needs to be followed by actions, for example, more education, more enforcement efforts, uh, more intelligence and infiltration of the groups that are activating, uh, that are active among right and and and, and left uh, extreme uh, uh, ranks, also um, uh, of course, if needed, among some of them, uh, uh, some of those with the immigration background. Um, I think this is also needs to be the take mm. out of all of that. I mean, um, the, the the head of the Jewish Council also said, you know. Uh, Protection can never be uh, bulletproof. You know, we can never have any guarantee that any security is good enough. What we would want to see is free lives that don't need any more protection. We mm. don't want to be hiding from the German society. We want to be living freely and safely. Mm. Um, and that it also requires actions on the ground. Mm. Uh, let's come back to Olaf Scholz. He's not really known for his fiery uh, speeches, uh, but I found it. A bit pedestrian, uh, don't you think? The wouldn't Jews in Germany appreciate a more passionate speech? Or is today not the day for passion? I, I don't know. I think Jews in the last couple of weeks have been um, traumatized. Um, many of them are just fearful. Period. Uh, I think they appreciate any show of solidarity, um, and. Yeah, I think we need to be, as much as, as we can appreciate passion, um, we need to be very careful with passion on both sides. I think there's too much passion uh, going on. Maybe we want to calm down. And again, we go back to the consequences, to actions on the ground. Um, I think the German government has shown a great commitment, at least on paper, 
to the cause of, of allowing Jewish life in Germany, in modern Germany, to be free and safe. Um, and that for itself is quite a relief and an important message to be sending out. He also uh, stated very clearly, and of course it's not the first time uh, that uh, German um, politicians say that, that we do not tolerate anti-Semitism. In the light of recent events on German streets, is that true? Or do we need to see this, a, a stricter well, response, a stronger response? I, I think we've seen, I mean, the, the, the instinct for the German uh, police, for example, at the beginning was to ban, you know, all, to, to ban all, all demonstrations of, of uh, trying to show solidarity with, with the Palestinians. And again, we always need to, this is such a complex issue, we need to make sure that we don't mix um, Israel with Jews and we don't mix Hamas with Palestinians. There are different sides. Um, there's many people involved in this conflict. Many of them are in pain, rightfully so, and we need to be able to let each side uh, grief and show its pain and be supported in its pain. But we also need to maintain uh, the, the limits of discussion and, and actions when it comes to, to what the support entails. Um, I, I find that um, within Germany, um, what he was trying to also t talk about was the, the fear of indifference, you know? This is not mine. This is about them, this is about the Muslims, about the Jews, about the immigrants, about, you know, uh, that is the biggest threat, you know, the indifference. This is what lets uh, uh, extre extremism grow wherever you go. Uh, when Germans understand that when ext extremism takes stronghold of Germany, everybody's gonna be in danger, that's, going to be the right achievement. This is where we need to aspire, because extremism and violence, brutalism, terror, it doesn't threat only specific communities. It starts with that, and then the slope, uh, the slippery slope is, is really, you know, the consequences can be very dire. Shani, uh, Rohan is there. Thank you very much. I You're think welcome. That Go ahead. pretty much sums it up. And we come back to the situation in Gaza now, where fears are growing at the deteriorating conditions. The World Health Organization has warned that disrupted healthcare facilities, poor water supplies and sanitation have created fertile conditions for the rapid spreading of infectious diseases. Surrounded by rotting waste and stagnant water, and with no access to clean facilities, Thousands of Gazans who have fled their homes now live in this camp operated by the United Nations Agency for Palestinians, UNRWA, in the southern city of Khan Yunus. Facing new threats to their health. There are no proper bathrooms. The situation is horrific. The health conditions are really bad, a catastrophe. The garbage and the diseases are affecting the children. Diseases are reportedly spreading quickly in Gaza. The World Health Organization says cases of chickenpox, scabies, diarrhea and respiratory infections are rapidly increasing, especially among young children. And the situation is getting worse as the number of people seeking shelter continues to rise. In the Khan Yunus training center, where 22,000 displaced men, women, and children are of sought shelter, the space per person is less, than, is less than two square meters, and there's one toilet for 600 people. Um, our colleagues at UNRWA said that the worsening sanitary conditions, along with the lack of privacy and space, pose great risks to the health and safety of those sheltering there. The hospitals still in operation in Gaza are already stretched to capacity. And these new outbreaks of infection and disease are adding more pressure, with vaccines and treatments in ever-shortening supply. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ruled out a broader ceasefire in Gaza unless the nearly 240 hostages taken by Hamas are freed. The families of some of those taken uh, captive were in Brussels to ask EU lawmakers to help secure the release of their loved ones. Eitan is just 12 years old. The last time he was seen alive was on the day Hamas militants broke into his home in Kibbutz near Oz on October 7. He was driven into Gaza on the back of a motorcycle. 
This is his aunt, Ayala. She has a special bond with him because he was born on her 30th birthday. He loves animals. All his pictures is with animals. He sees the weak. I hope <laughs> that he gets the strength to help the weak there. I know that Eitan is alive. I know, I know. Eitan's father, Ohad, has also not been seen since the day of the attack. In the chaos of the violence, the family were separated. It's believed he's also being held in Gaza. This is just one family story. Others are here too. They've come to the European Parliament to ask for help to get their loved ones released. Yoni Asher's wife and daughters, who are four and two years old, are German citizens. Is this passport, German passport, it's a piece of paper? It has any value? If it's just a piece of paper, why does people need it? The families delivered passionate pleas and the message was heard. They want also the European Union, the European institutions, our countries to be involved in the negotiations to release them. We have to be part of that. Huh? European politicians, uh, members of the Commission, uh, from the Council, that we all have to do our part also in this process. Why has Europe not been doing that? Uh, I think that right now is the Israeli government who is doing the, these uh, negotiations. I don't know. But I think that we should ask to be also part of this. For Ayala, every day that passes is a day too long. I can't even find the words, words of what I'm feeling. Ohad is my older brother. He's, I admire him. He's my best friend. I miss him. And Eitan? He's just a small boy that I can't believe that he's on this monster's hands. We are in a nightmare. But she still has hope. It's help she's asking for. And earlier I spoke to our correspondent uh, Rebecca Rittes in Jerusalem and I asked her about reports that talks are underway involving the potential release of several hostages in return for a temporary pause in fighting. Well, despite that, we're hearing that the talks are ongoing. Israel, of course, not directly involved in the talks with Hamas, but working through intermediaries from Qatar and Egypt. They have been instrumental in the hostage releases that have happened so far. Unfortunately, we've not seen many. And, of course, there's hope that there will be more. Now, this particular deal uh, involves about 10 to 15 people, we believe, that they are said to... Uh, that they will release uh, in return for a 48 to 72 to our ceasefire in hostilities in order to allow for the for aid to be brought into Gaza Strip. Uh, as you say, Israel continue, continues to say that they have no intention of any ceasefire until all the hostages have been released, but they are under a lot of pressure uh, to, to make sure that some host the hostages, or all of the hostages, come out 